Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us at uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, the Harris County office. Uh, welcome again to another homegrown lecture series. Uh, today we have Shannon Dietz, the county ag agent, and he's going to be talking about grilling safely outdoors. Uh, before we get started, uh, he will show um, some slides at the end but uh, there are three more topics for this quarter. Uh, in two weeks, Paul Winsky will be talking about fall vegetable gardening. That is August 19th. Um, and then also a reminder, we do have a new podcast. Um, we started that, it is on our newsletter. It is also on our Facebook page. We just released uh, episode three last week with uh, myself interviewing Harris County Master Gardener, Will Isbell. Uh, so we have those other um, extensions to our Homegrown series. Uh, for now, we're going to go ahead and welcome Shannon Dietz while he is uh, donning his apron and LSU um, oh. info in the back. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yep. And uh, welcome. Got all the universities represented. <laughs> Grilling safely outdoors. All right. Thank you, Brandy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Brandy, for that. Uh, awesome introduction and um, I hope that you are ready to get your taste buds really wet today because um, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite activities uh, which is grilling and um, I will put a disclaimer out there in the beginning I am not um, a grill pro uh, I'm very much a grill amateur but I love grilling and I will also uh, put the disclaimer out there that uh, I am not uh, a nutritionist or a dietitian or anything, but um, all my information and research um, has been gathered from Extension Publications and have reached out to um, several people with Texas A&M and gotten information to put this presentation together. So uh, hopefully uh, you do some more research on a lot of the information that we're sharing with you today and 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 uh, that is kind of really the point of the uh, homegrown series is that we provide you with this information and then you take it and further inform yourself, further educate yourself and so forth like that and really dive in to the subject matter and so forth. So with that being said, we're going to be talking about grilling safety outdoors today. And um, like I said, we're going to be covering a wide variety of things. Uh, we're going to try and touch on a couple different points, but we are going to leave room for um, questions uh, throughout the presentation. So I've already mentioned to Paul and Brandy that uh, if you have a question, type it in the chat box and um, I don't mind answering questions throughout the presentation or if we want to hold them towards the end. And if I don't have the answers to your questions, I will be glad to get back in touch with you on that. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and move forward. I got my apron on, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I got my beef loving Texan cap. I got my beef loving koozie on my water to keep hydrated because it's going to be hot outside today. And we're acting like the grill is behind me and there's all this flavorful smoke coming up. And I got my spatula and my tongs and we're ready. And um, I'm missing one piece of equipment and uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but um, that that's kind of a a no no at the grilling area. So we're going to talk about those tools and stuff like that. So moving on, we're going to talk about a couple goals that we would like to discuss or I'd like to share with you today. Um, first one is going to be how we uh, incorporate grilling as a fun way to incorporate family time. Uh, one of some of my favorite memories, uh, obviously growing up in the South. Uh, barbecuing is just a natural way of family time and building those bonding sessions with family, extended family and so forth. Um, barbecue pits come in all different shapes and sizes. And um, so if you have not had the opportunity to um, participate in a family barbecue or something, I hope that this information today will encourage you to host a family barbecue in the future and start to build some of those memories. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences between gas and charcoal grilling. 
Um, I will tell you up front that I'm kind of an old school guy. I'm a charcoal guy. Um, so we will kind of lean more heavily on that side, but we will touch um, all the different areas um, of grilling available. Talk about some grilling safety tips around the home for you and your family that is hopefully going to keep you out of the hospital uh, because we want everybody to be safe. We're dealing with combustibles here. We're dealing with fire. We're dealing with uh, bacteria and everything. So there's a lot of things that come into, um, into our area that that people can either get harm from or get sick from and everything. So we wanna make sure that you have the, um, the information needed to hopefully um, stay out of those particular areas. Uh, we're gonna talk about some meats to grill um, and show you some delicious pictures hopefully in the end. We're gonna talk about some other options that you might not have thought about that the grill is good for. And then we're gonna go into some uh, questions and talk about some recipes and so forth. But I did want to start off with this particular fact sheet and kind of make you aware of some of the uh, dangers that are um, present when we talk about grilling and so forth. And we talked about like fire, we talked about the possibility of, um, you know, people getting exposed to different bacteria and E. coli and stuff like that. So um, about 10,600 home fires are started buy grills each year on average. Um, really, really sad statistic to hear about because, um, you know, that that is something that can easily be, um, um, easily be, uh, what's the word for it, um, avoided. And um, by just following a couple simple rules and so forth. And, and obviously here in the South, and most of the time we can, we can grill pretty much 365 um year round and it's kind of funny because when i was putting this presentation together every winter it seems like i think the people up north get really jealous when we're able to barbecue or grill out on the patio or whatever when the weather's nice like around november december january if we have uh, pretty nice weather and then i've seen a picture on facebook where the guy's up to his waist in snow with this bear cap on and he's out on the patio and flipping burgers and so forth. So uh, we do have that advantage here, but July is the peak month for grills, grills, fires, followed by June, May and August. Um, talk about the number of cases that go to the hospital on, on average um, and with those 9,500 of them being burns. Um, so that's a pretty serious um, thing when you have to start talking about that. Um, so not, not only includes the person who's cooking the stuff or the grill or the uh, the food, but it also could possibly uh, involve some of those people nearby and so forth. And at least 64% of US households own at least one outdoor barbecue grill or smoker. So that's really good for the industry. Uh, we have seen a lot more uh, products hit the market. Um, at a lot of the big box stores and different things like that. When it comes to grilling, um, not only uh, have the grills gotten a lot fancier, people have really started to do outdoor kitchens a lot more elaborately and so forth. And then the grills, um, you have the green eggs versus your old school uh, Weber grills and so forth, which are just as fine as everything else. So the price ranges vary considerably. Uh, when you start talking about grills. So you definitely want to go into this with a budget. And we're going to be talking a little bit later on about some of those questions that you should address uh, when considering purchasing a grill and so forth. But um, the first question we're going to kind of pose to the group. And uh, if if uh, Brandy and Paul uh, could be watching the chat group, um, we're going to be talking about propane, electric and charcoal. And I would kind of like to poll the group real quick um like over the next minute if everybody can just type in if you do have a grill uh are you propane are you team electric are you team charcoal um and so you already know where i stand with that um and i would kind of like to get a, um, a feel for where the group is that we have here today so uh take a minute uh or a second and uh, just type that in and um Brandy, when y'all, Brandy or Paul, when y'all see a couple of them coming in, um, or enough of them, I'm not sure how many's on the group or something, but uh, just let me know. That way we'll know who our audience is today. 
So team propane, team electric, or team charcoal, which one are you? All right, and uh, there's definitely, it, what I learned was there's a little bit of a delay. So if you just want to come back to that in a minute. Okay, all right, right, will do. All right, so yeah, you definitely have some time to do that. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. And then when you talked about, uh, and Brandy, just jump in whenever you have like results on that. So when we talked about um, previously choosing your grill, some of the questions that you're going to want to ask is um, how much time or how much do you want to cook at a time? Uh, if you're a single person or if you're in a small household and it's maybe just you and your your significant other, your wife or what have you, or um, if you have a large family, if there's four or five of you, uh, that is going to determine what type of grill that you're going to want to um, consider when looking at, at the market and so forth. Obviously, um, the more people that you're talking about, if you're going to be entertaining more often, you're going to want a larger type of grill area. Um, as opposed to something smaller um, that you can fit on a patio and so forth. How much room do you have for storage? Um, this is a very important question because obviously there are some times when you do have to put your grill up um, and there are uh, grill covers that are made for those now. Um, and so do you have an outside storage space? Do you have a little, um, uh, little closet off the edge of your patio and so forth? So that's something you're going to want to consider. You're not definitely going to want to leave it out in the weather and different things. All right, um, Shannon. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it looks like charcoal is winning so far. Uh, charcoal, okay. a three for charcoal, uh, a couple for propane, one for gas, but uh, it looks like there's some uh, preference drama in some households. Uh, one husband likes charcoal, but the wife likes propane. Uh-oh, how <laughs> and, uh, and then even um, this one was cute. Uh, I don't know why they decided this, but it works. Pro propane on weeknights, char charcoal on weekends. So they're, you know, they're, uh, they take, you know, they use both. There you go. I mean, uh, got to keep everybody happy in the family, right? So that's interesting. So uh, definitely got to hear the amount of charcoal people we have in the room. So like I said, we will be sharing uh, some more information on that particular area. And so that question is, do you prefer the charcoal taste over the gas briquettes? Uh, some of, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's something you should consider in, uh, you know, the dating process. Does your partner uh, side with you or do you have to figure that you're going to have to go another route and so forth? So uh, it's just something uh, kind of humorously you might want to look at. How often will you use the grill? Um, is the money that you're going to be investing in a grill, is it going to be worth spending four or $500 or more on a green egg? Or um, can you go with the, um, the Weber version, you know, and even those versions that you see now, uh, the more pit, uh, pit um, grills, combination smokers, if it's got like a little um, side heating area on it that you can heat up your barbecue sauce and everything. So, uh, how often will you be using the grill? And then lastly, obviously, how much do you want to spend? What's in the budget for that and so forth? So next, we're going to just jump right into um, some grilling safety tips. So on each one of these, um, the charcoal, the propane and the electric. Um, the first one, uh, you know, that we're going to, well, in general, we're going to talk about propane and charcoal barbecue grills should only be used outside and um, some of these are going to be common sense um, statements so I do apologize if they seem kind of um, unnecessarily from for me to repeat but um, you know you always hear in certain situations um, where people use um, generators indoors whenever you know just when we had the winter air uh, winter storm you know people when they're pushed to certain limits um, you know they kind of forget about the um, the carelessness and the accidents that could has to possibly happen as a result of these things. So you never want to, never ever want to incorporate propane or charcoal barbecue grills in the house. Um, the grill should always be placed away from the home and other structures. That's one of the things that we talked about with the house fires and everything. You should have a dedicated, if you can, um, barbecue area. Um, and, um, I know uh, where I live right now, we can't have it within six foot of the structure and so forth. So 
Um, you know, they definitely don't want it right up next to the structure and so forth. So obviously, if you have a flare up and everything, when you're considering fire, um, you know, things can happen very, very quickly. And if you're not ready for them, um, you know, things can escalate um, in, a, in a very bad way. You never want to leave the grill unattended, um, especially when you have a, a live fire going on. Now, if you have something that is a smoker um, and you're just actually using that heat from that, you still want to stay away from um, permanent structures and so forth. But you don't have to, I call it babysit as much if you had a live fire. So you're actually only using the heat for um, for cuts like your briskets and your ribs and different things like that. So, and then lastly for gas grills, you always want to open the grill lid before lighting because of the um, the gas escape and so forth like that. So um, if you that that brings in a whole nother level of uh, precautionary um, that you have to deal with when you're dealing with gas and everything. And it, it's it's kind of one of the areas that or one of the reasons why I really don't particularly care to use gas grills and so forth. And um, but anyway, that's just my soapbox. Uh, charcoal grills will allow you to incorporate a variety of smoke flavors in your grilling. I don't know when was the last time that you've been in one of the box stores um, and looked at the barbecue aisle as opposed to maybe like, you know, five, six years ago, they have definitely expanded into a lot more niche um, market group. Um, so uh, grilling has definitely become a very much uh, industry, just like gardening has, um, just like um, a lot of the other departments in the stores and so forth like that. So anyway, where I'm going with this is they have actual bags where you can buy applewood, mesquite, oak um, chips and everything like that. And you can incorporate those into your briquettes and so forth and then give off that smell. Now, I will tell you when you incorporate uh, those chips and everything, read the directions. Um, that is one of the things that you're going to want to do. You're not going to want to put the chips in dry. You're going to want to soak them in water for about 15, 20 minutes because you're not going to want to actually have them burn. You're going to want to actually have them release smoke and so forth. So that smoke is going to give off that flavor and so forth. So um, I have done it actually a couple of times where I've gotten the chips and I've had them smoking, um, soaking in the water and I forgot to actually incorporate them into the grill and everything. And I and I saw them sitting off to the side after the fact. Uh, later on, we were actually eating everything and we're like, oh, yeah. So uh, you have to get used to it and so forth. Decide how you want to start your fire. So charcoal grills allow you to do that. Um, you um, and this is pretty much all the grills and so forth. Um, you can choose to use lighter fluid or other methods of light. Um, I don't really prefer using lighter fluid anymore. Uh, my charcoal all comes uh, pre-soaked or um, and it just helps with um, a safety factor that you don't have to have a flammable liquid near an open fire or so forth like that. So um, if you want to spend a couple extra bucks and get those charcoal briquettes, um, pretty much every brand does them now where they're soaked with lighter fluid already and you don't have to have that um, that lighter fluid um, sitting next to your charcoal or or what have you. And for me, it doesn't um, it helps with the taste, too, because some people can go crazy with the lighter fluid and everything, and it really, really uh, affects the taste of your your meat or whatever you're cooking on the grill. So um, you always want to properly dispose of cool briquettes in a disposable metal container. So um, that's one thing you might want to invest in like um, and it basically is a trash can, a metal trash can um, and with a lid on it uh, because you do not want it actually um, having water get in it because it's obviously that's where you're going to dump all your ash and everything. So um, use that and you'll be on the safe side, but make sure it's cooled whenever you dump it into the metal container because that metal container would become very, very hot if you dump live um, heated charcoal briquettes in it before they cool off. And um, you get to en enjoy the time to slow cook your meat with the charcoal grills and so forth. So 
um, advantages there. How about the propane grills? Okay, we talked about that as well. Um, this is one that can produce a very high intense feed, heat in a very fast time. So it's got a fast preheat. You can control the temperature um, as opposed to a, um, a charcoal um, barbecue. Some of them have the built-in therm uh, thermostat on them. Some of them don't. Some of the older versions don't. It just depends. Um, I would say if you are looking to invest in a, a grill, make sure you get one with an internal or a temperature gauge that shows what your heat is on there. Uh, but the propane, you can't control the temperature. Your food is done or in, done in a faster time frame. So if you're always on a busy schedule and you just kind of want that grill taste and you want that grill flavor, um, you don't want to heat up the kitchen or anything like that, propane might be the way to go. And there's easy cleanup, no charcoal mess after the fact. Advantages of charcoal, of electric grills, um, and that's kind of a new um, neighbor to the market. So we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, it does give you a smaller workspace, um, and there, and with the electric grills, you are kind of tied to being next to obviously an electrical outlet or a very long extension cord or so forth. So um, those are some barriers that you might have that you will run into and so forth. But some of the advantages are that you can grill in places more than traditional grills. They're usually lightweight. They're usually easier to transport. And um, so that gives you an advantage there. They, they will generate less smoke and you do not need lighter fluid or charcoal. Um, they're easy to clean up. They come in a variety of sizes, which we talked about, and they're usually energy efficient. Um, and so they follow a lot of those um, energy guidelines and so forth. So one of the things we talked about earlier is uh, the dangers of or being prepared if you have a propane grill and um, what some of the things are that could lead to a bad experience with um, injury or, or what have you. So I have a link here and we're going to play this real quick, but you always, your one of your main concerns with propane grills is you always want to check for leaks, whether it be at the site where you turn the knob on, where there's leak there, or your hose can actually become um, uh, dry rotted and you could, uh, you might not necessarily see the leaks, but you could smell the gas um so but uh, it might be time to get a new hose replacement and so forth so um what we're going to do here is we're going to hopefully click on this link here and uh we are going to see a youtube video and brandy is this this showing uh not yet Shannon, if it's on another screen, you're going to have to share that screen. Yes, let's see. OK, oops. Um, so I might have messed up a little bit here. Um, so I can fill you in on the, um, basically the gist of it. So we're going to keep moving right along. So basically it's just a short presentation on, um, with a propane grill and what you're going to want to do is, uh, each season before you start, if you happen to smell any of the leak, um, come out, you can mix um, water and uh, liquid de detergent, um, make a little soapy um, structure uh, solution and take like a small paintbrush or a little um, any type of uh, like a basting brush or something that you wouldn't use uh, that you would just keep for this particular um, uh, project and you would dip your brush into the water and soap solution and then you would pass it around where the um, 
connection of the nozzle and the um, the nozzle and the hose is at. And so you would want to see, it would be basically like um, if you had a flat tire. So when the gas is escaping or air is escaping, it's going to make little bubbles. And that's going to be an indication that you have a leak there. You might have to take the hose off and then readjust it into, to the nozzle. Um, sometimes that's all it is that you maybe put it on a little crooked, or you're also going to want to provide that or put that um, soapy solution on the hose itself. Uh, and that will determine if and tell you if you have a crack or a leak in the um, the hose itself and you might need to get a new one. Uh, you know, if it's uh, if it's been used for a couple years and you don't necessarily have a cover for it, it's eventually the weather is going to take its toll on it. So uh, you're going to want to keep up with with those things and that's going to keep you in the clear for a lot of dangerous uh, factors there. When you're talking about grilling, especially in the summer, uh, if you haven't used your pit in a while, or maybe say, for example, if you haven't, um, if it's been put up over the winter time and uh, you're using it for the first time in the spring or early summer and so forth like that, when you're opening the lid for the first time, be careful. Um, there could be some critters that have might have moved in there over the winter and uh, taken habit or household in there. Uh, sometimes you have wasp nests that might start in there. Uh, it's a popular space for snakes to hang out and so forth. So just be prepared whenever you open that lid for the first time, especially if you keep it in an area that um, that might attract like any type of mice or anything like that. And you can have to do a thorough clean before you use it for the first time in your grill. Um, and so that's going to keep it in good working order and so forth like that. All right, so now we're going to move on to preparing food safely, safely, uh, which is the general um, theme of our presentation here today. And we're going to kind of go through some food safety rules and so forth. Uh, but before we get into that, has anybody posted any questions that I need to address, uh, Brandy or Paul? Uh, uh, nope, not yet. OK, We're just fascinated by uh, by all the information. OK, all right. So um, food safety is uh, your number one factor in addition to getting your grill ready. Uh, this is you have that factor that's playing in that you don't want to get any uh, burns or any explosions or any uh, other persons hurt by um, incorporating fire and, um, you know, uh, lighter fluid and different things like this. So this is something that you can easily control as well on how you uh, purchase your food and how you get it, how you keep it safe until it time it hits the grill, actually. So whenever you're dealing with food, um, you're always going to want to wash your hands before and after handling food. So a lot of times people don't realize the amount of um, bacteria and germs and everything that you have on your hands before you get started. Um, there are a lot more people that are using gloves now, um, like the uh, the surgeon gloves. Um, that that helps a lot. Um, obviously, you won't need to. Uh, wash your hands if you're going to be using those um, and that is an automatic barrier for you coming into contact with any of these bacterial organisms or anything like that once you start handling food products and so forth. So either wash your hands before and after or use the surgical gloves which is and um, a real popular option now. Um, if you have any spills or liquids immediately clean those up. And um, that could be and not necessarily a spill, but like, say, for example, if you're working with um, ground beef or any type of beef or chicken or anything, and whenever they sit in packages at the store, when you go to HEB and you pick them up, those cuts of beef or pieces of chicken or whatever will naturally leak natural fluids, you know, so that will that is the purpose of the food tray and everything. It catches those. So um you could have um some of those actually leak whenever you take that 
uh, cellophane wrapper off and so forth. So it might not necessarily be a spill that you made, but just be careful that when you're uh, opening food or cuts of beef or anything like that for the first time, there will be some juices that naturally occur there. Clean anything that comes into contact with food, such as knives, plates, countertops. Um, I would suggest if you don't, there are a lot of products out there now that are bacteria killers, um, spray on, um, or you can create your own um, sanitizing solution. Um, and usually that's a teaspoon of bleach to one quart of water, and that will usually knock out any type of bacteria and so forth like that. Um, if you're using any tools, and I say tools, whether it be knives, forks, or anything like that, that comes in direct contact with meat, you're okay with washing that in a bleach solution as well. Um, and that will definitely uh, kill all those bacteria organis organisms. Marinate, if you're gonna marinate, marinate the meat in the refrigerator and you never ever want to reuse marinade, okay? Um, and even if you have a little left in the bottle, um, I would still throw that bottle away because you never know if uh, in the fridge, it could expire eventually. Um, so I would suggest either you use all the marinade that is in the bottle, or if you have any left, just throw it away, but you never use, reuse any marinade. Uh, you're gonna wanna learn the internal temperatures of food and purchase a food thermometer. There are hundreds of food thermometers out there, and I would suggest a food thermometer is probably one of the most important purchases that you can make to keep you and your family safe other than the barbecue grill itself. Um, the days of visual um, understanding if, you're, if your food is correct, you know, and we're gonna get into this a little bit more, if your food is at a correct temperature or you can't go by if it's brown anymore, that you automatically think that it's done because you're not really sure what heat it's cooked at and so forth like that. So. Um, we're going to talk about internal temperatures in a little bit on the next slide from there after this one, and we're going to go into that a little bit more. Food thermometers, very, very, very important. They have digital, uh, they have kinds, they have the Bluetooth kind now where you can actually uh, stick the prongs in your food while it's on the grill and you can sit, uh, if you're smoking, you can sit in the living room uh, and watch the temperature rise and lower with that. Um, or you can be sitting on 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 your um, in your chair right next to the pit and so forth without having to constantly open the lid because every time you open the lid, you're it's like opening the oven. The temperature goes down and you have to build that temperature up again. Refrigerate food within two hours after grilling in hot weather, which we have pretty often here in Houston, um, which most of you probably realize that the rule needs to be breaking uh, brought down to one hour. All right, so one hour in hot weather, um, if it's warm or uh, late winter, um, late fall or early winter or something like that, you can go um, two hours, okay? So we talked a little bit about temperatures for grilling meat and um, this is a pretty um, good slide here that I found um, and it breaks it down by species, beef, pork, chicken, turkey and fish. A lot of people don't think about grilling fish uh, but it is one of those options that have become a lot more popular. Uh, we do live on the Gulf uh, where we have a natural abundance of seafood um, at our back door and we can get it pretty fresh. So uh, if you've never had uh, grilled shrimp or grilled redfish or um, uh, grilled salmon, um, please uh, consider maybe including that on your menu for future use. But you can see here ground beef, uh, when we talk about ground beef, the internal temperature, 160 degrees. Obviously, you can't tell, like say, for example, if you got a ground patty, a hamburger on the grill, it's not gonna say, hey, I'm ready. It's not. It doesn't have a little plug like a turkey whenever you're cooking it for Thanksgiving that the plug is gonna pop up and say, I'm done, you know, kind of type thing. So a meat thermometer, strongly, strongly suggest. Steak, 145, that is at medium, um, that is at me, uh, medium, yes, okay. So if you wanna bring it up to medium well, you would probably get around the 160 mark and so forth like that. But uh, it is safe to eat at 145. That ground beef, you're incorporating, a, the temperature's a lot higher there. 
because of the process where you're incorporating or possibly incorporating a lot more food bacteria organisms into the factor. So you have a grinder, you have people involved with using their hands, uh, even though it's they're gloved and everything, you have the factor of the cleanliness of the grinder and different things like that. So you wanna make sure that, that those ground beef um, items that you cooked are at least cooked to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Pork, um, we're talking about uh, pork chops and sausage, very popular on the grills here. Uh, 165, 145. Chicken is always going to be at least 165, okay? And that's chicken breasts and chicken legs and chicken thighs. Um, usually, um, your dark meat is going to take a little bit longer to cook than your white meat, your breast meat, and so forth. And then it's also going to take a little bit longer to cook if you have bone in, um, as opposed to boneless thighs or um, as opposed to thighs with bones in. Um, turkey is another popular option that a lot of people are using. Um, they're barbecuing their turkeys now for Thanksgiving. Who would have thought? All right. So it's um, think about the, the grill as an outside oven, basically. So, um, you know, it comes in handy a lot. And uh, we have to remind ourselves sometimes that if we have invested in a grill outside, hey, why don't we use it? You know, um, the heat in the summer, a lot of people don't want to be tied down to the kitchen because it heats up the kitchen so often and you're paying for that electricity as opposed to going out and buying, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten dollar bag of charcoal um, and then throwing it on there, you know, so um, you get to you get to make memories doing that as well. Shrimp and salmon and we talked about that as well. So if you haven't included those on your uh, menu, feel free to do so. So next we're going to talk about um, just checking the time. Uh, how hot is your temperature? So there is um, a rule that a lot of people are using is the um, the four second rule. All right. So the number of seconds here on the chart, we have two, three, four and five. All right. So basically, if you put your hand above the charcoal briquettes and they're fully lighted just like the picture there where they're white so obviously they start with black if you've never grilled before they start as black briquettes and as you light them they will turn white and that white factor will mean that it's turning to ash all right so that's the that's the reason for that color disfiguration there um so the longer that you can keep your hand on top of the briquettes uh, if you count by 1001, 1002, and you can't keep your hand there anymore, your temperature is too hot. All right. So that means it's about 375 degrees or hotter, and it is way too hot to put your uh, your meat items or your vegetables or anything on because they will char. They will burn really quickly. If you can hold it 1001, 1002, 1003, that gives you about a 350 to 375 degree temperature. But what we're shooting for is four, all right? So 1001 to 1004, if you can keep your hand there, that's the ideal temperature when you can go ahead and start putting your meat on. If you can hold it for any longer, after you count like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you've let your charcoal briquettes burn too long, and you're basically gonna have to start over. You're gonna have to add some more charcoal, charcoal to it because um, like a lot of people say, basically all you have is a hand warmer. Um, and it is gonna, you're gonna get frustrated because your meat's not cooking. Uh, it's not following the regular cooking uh, method and so forth. So it's very tricky. Um, a lot of people like to grill with a flame. All right, and we're gonna talk about some of the meats that you can grill with a flame a little bit later on, but I just want to share that information with you there. All right, grilling basics. So whenever you build your fire on a charcoal grill, you're basically want, you're going to want to make zones. All right. So um, there are a couple of different ways that you can lay out your charcoal in a, a, a barbecue pit. Um, so you can use the grid method which is basically the depending on the size, the, the area of your grill, you can make either a four by four square or a six by six. Six by six is usually um, preferred. So basically you would do six briquettes down 
and six briquettes across and then fill in that square. All right. So with that being said, um, you can create zones on your grill. And this doesn't just happen on the charcoal and you can also create zones on your propane as well. Uh, so you it has, usually has multiple burners. So you can have on the left side, your burners at adjusted at about a 300 to 350 temperature. And then on your right side, you can have it turned down where you're just gonna keep your cooked foods at a warmer temperature, all right? So uh, basically you're doing the same thing on the charcoal grill. So you have a direct cooking method where you apply, you have that six by six or four by four grid, and you're applying that meat directly onto the grill and um, that's a direct cooking method. Okay, so um, you're very important. You're always going to want to stay within the grid. You're not going to want to move outside that charcoal area because that is dead space. You will have some heat there, but it won't be that indirect heat. Also, when you're putting your meat on the grill, make sure you have at least a half inch to an inch space in between your foods that you put down because you do need that air circulation going through. That's what's going to cook your meat, all right? And so if you have it covered, if you have your grill covered, you're basically just getting the underneath of it cooked. You're not getting those sides cooked. And especially when you have the lid on it, you're not having that convection and that air circulation and so forth in there. So make sure you put a space in between there, all right? Um, I have to take a drink from my beef loving um, koozie water. Sorry about that. Did y'all know Texas is the largest, uh, ha has the most farms and ranches producing about 150,000, um, is it, um, let's see, uh, 150,000 farms and uh, ranches in Texas producing more cattle and beef than any other state in Texas. So we're, we're beef proud here in Texas. So indirect cooking method, that is whenever you have, say for example, you have your heat on one side and you're putting your meat whatever you're cooking on the other side. So it's that temperature that you got going on. It's your meat is not directly over the coals or it's not over the flame of a propane gas uh, or light at that time, but you're still getting the effect of an indirect cooking method. And then the last one is the fall wrap method which I have a picture of there. You know, guys, this is another invention that's really come a long ways. Fall method, rapid fall wrap method really works well with fish and veggies and stuff like that. So this is packets that you can buy from uh, HEB or your box stores. You actually uh, put your 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 um, your protein, uh, your veggies and everything in there and you seal it up with a little bit of moisture and you season it and everything. And that acts as its own little oven in there as well. And then you can open it up and then you have your little pouch. Uh, it helps a lot with veggies that are kind of small. If you don't want to use skewers or anything, put them in the pouch and it helps a lot. Oxygen, okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about this and then I'm going to try and speed it up because, but we're coming up to the end, so I think we're doing good. Oxygen, your friend and enemy. It's all about controlling the heat of live coals. And this is mostly uh, dealing with charcoal grills, um, I don't know how many of you, well, several of you have charcoal grills in here, and I don't know how many of you actually utilize the vents uh, to your advantage when cooking your, um, your meat, your proteins, or your veggies, or anything like that. So usually there's a vent at the bottom of your grill, and there's usually a vent at the top, all right? So obviously fire needs oxygen in order to to happen okay so you can control the amount of fire or you can decrease the amount of fire by decreasing or increasing the the uh, expansion of the vent all right so if you want a high flow of oxygen that's going to make the coals burn a lot hotter and faster um, I, safety warning these vents get very very hot so make sure that you have an oven mitt or you have something that you um, use to help open them. You don't want to touch them with your bare hands because they will get very, very hot. Um, low oxygen decreases cooking temps. So if you see that your food is cooking really fast and you want to slow it down a little bit, you can adjust it. Uh, you wouldn't close it off all the way, 
but you definitely want to keep that convection going. So whatever you close it or open up at the top, you definitely want to do the same thing at the bottom. So they're kind of coordinating at the same time. So I would encourage you to learn to properly use the vents uh, to your advantage and so forth. So I think it can make a big difference um, if you have flare ups and so forth like that. Um, it's always good to have that two zone operation on your grill where you can, um, whenever you're cooking anything, um, the more fat, the more moisture that your protein is going to have, it's going to in increase the amount of drippage and that drippage is going to go directly onto the charcoal briquettes. And that usually, if it's fat or anything like that, is going to automatically cause flare ups because of the fire. It's like adding uh, gas to the fire. You're not, but that fat is going to burn. It's grease. OK, so you just take that uh, chicken or steak or whatever have you that you're grilling on that side, move it to your side that you don't have those uh, high intense charcoal briquettes on. And then once the fire goes down, you can move it back over. Never use water um, to put out a fire on your charcoal briquettes because you're defeating the purpose of the of the heat and the charcoal um, and the heat so forth. If you see that you're running out of heat, uh, if your thermostat on your charcoal or your grill starts to drop significantly, um, you know, um, not all chalk, not all charcoal burns the same at the same pace and so forth. So you might have had charcoal that had more lighter fluid built into it and so forth. So you need to watch if you see that your charcoal is turning to ash on a quicker basis. It's there's nothing wrong with going in and adding more charcoal. So we're going to talk about a couple of recommended cuts for grilling uh, here, and we're going to be specifically speaking about beef. Um, beef ribs, one of my favorites. Um, it's a it's a cut of meat that's pretty rare to find in most uh, barbecue joints around here. Uh, if you go out to more of the countrysides and so forth, you can run into it there. But um, this is a set of beef ribs that's been cut in half. Normally, you get the full size rib and so forth. Uh, but they're a grilling standard. They can be marinated or slow cooked to give them a wide range of flavors. Um, choose one, choose ones with fine lines of white marbling in the meat. Um, and some of our presentations before we talked about marbling. Marbling is the amount of fat in the beef, and that's what gives it that moisture, um, that tenderness and so forth. Uh, the leaner pieces of meat are going to be tougher. They don't have that fat uh, built into them and so forth. All right, and it's also going to add to the flavor of the meat. New York strip. Uh, this is another grilling standard. It's a cut of meat that's found at almost every restaurant uh, that you usually go out to, so it's pretty common. Um, expectations can be high when grilling a New York strip, um, but it's a full, pretty full proof piece of meat. Um, you usually can't go wrong with it, and it's usually uh, moderately priced. Um, but uh, doesn't have a lot of marbling in it. You can see there's not a lot of fat content in this particular cut here. Uh, you can get some good grill marks on it, but you have to watch that you don't overcook it and use that thermometer. This is a good point when I should talk about the thermometer. Um, when you're using your thermometer to test the temperature of meat, you usually want to pick up that, um, and this is where my utensils come in before. You notice that I didn't hold up a fork. All right, a fork is a no no around the barbecue grilling area for the fact that every time you use a fork, you puncture the meat, obviously, whether it be beef or chicken or pork or anything like that. And when you puncture it, it releases the juices and it takes away the tenderness and the taste and everything like that. So if you have this is a pretty short set of tongs. Obviously, I wouldn't use this. This is kind of a last minute fill in. I didn't bring my regular barbecue tongs. But something that you can take it and grab it and you pick it up and then you would insert the thermometer on the side. All right. This is a pretty thick slice of uh, beef here where you can actually um, go in through the side and it'll give you an instant reading there. You usually don't want to take it up and down or put it on the top because you don't get that surface area covered to be able to stick that prong through and actually do that. So you can actually pick up the piece of meat off the grill and hold it into tongs and then insert your thermometer. Now, if you're going from beef to chicken and different things like that, 
you definitely don't want to cross contaminate. So either you have multiple thermometers that you use for chicken and beef and pork, or after every time you use it, uh, before you put it in another piece of meat or something like that, you're going to want to clean it thoroughly and so forth. So New York strip, good piece. Uh, porterhouse steak, that's an awesome piece. Um, you're going to be putting some big bucks down if you go out to the restaurant and you order a porterhouse steak, but you will definitely leave with a full stomach. Uh, this is a pretty large piece of steak. It's usually cooked rare um, to medium um, is the way most people like it. Um, medium at medium, you will have a lot more of the flavors that show up. Um, and um, a lot of people get turned off by the, the blood and so forth like that. So uh, again, everybody, if you're if you're cooking for a large crowd, make sure you understand how they want their meat cooked, especially if it's beef. If it's chicken, everybody's going to be getting the same type of chicken. Everybody's going to be getting the same temperature chicken cooked and so forth. Same thing for pork. Beef is the only one where it would apply to. All right, ribeye, um, a great standard, um, a great fall back on guys this is um just an excellent cut of beef that does really well on the grill um when it comes with the bone it's called the cowboy ribeye ribeye or cowboy cut you've seen a lot of those now um heb one of the favorite my favorite place to shop their uh meat market um they have quite a few cowboy steaks there um it's really cool um to open the grill and see something like that <clears throat> You don't get a lot of meat off the bone or anything like that, but it gives a great presentation. Um, and it's best grilled over low heat, indirect on a charcoal and made um, uh, usually for a little bit other cuts of meat, um, usually on, on taking to cook it and so forth like that. So um, great piece of meat and most people swear by it when they go out or they grill or anything, ribeye is always gonna be the choice of meat. Flat iron steak, skirt steak, um, any of these steaks like this have become really popular in the grocery stores lately. They used to be a really expensive cut of meat. A lot of times you see these that are prepackaged in the fajita meats and so forth now. Um, and you can even get the fajita chicken meat, like mostly the um, boneless thighs and so forth like that, that are usually marinated in different seasonings. And basically all you have to do is to take it out the packet and um, put it on the grill. A lot of times when you're when we're talking about fajitas, you're um, you can add uh, aluminum foil on top of the grill and poke holes in it for the juices to drain through. If the some of the meats are a smaller portion, you're definitely and they're you think they're going to have a problem or you might have a problem them falling through the grates. You can add a layer of um, aluminum foil. Um, to go over that to make sure that you don't lose any of your meat. But this is um, a flavorful steak comes from the bottom sides of, of the cow. Uh, I will tell you the more tender cuts of beef are going to come from the middle section of the cattle because your front and your rear end and your brisket area, those are more muscle areas. They're going to have more tendons in them. They're going to have more uh, muscles in those areas because they're used more often. Obviously, uh, they're associated with the legs. They transport the cow from point A to point B. That brisket's up there in the front, so that's used on a daily basis and everything. What's not used on a daily basis as far as muscle is that midsection where your prime rib, your steaks, your ribeye, your porterhouse and everything, your loin area and everything, where that's going to come from. So that is always going to be your tenderest and more than likely your more expensive pieces of uh, beef. One of the last things, guys, um, as far as ground beef, you can't, um, or talking about cooking, you can't leave out ground beef or ground chuck or anything. Homemade hamburgers. Who doesn't love a homemade hamburger coming straight off the grill? Um, have some great recipes for, uh, for homemade hamburgers. I know we're running kind of short on time here, so we're not going to about to get to everything, but you see the indentions there on those particular patties. The indentions do work. If you don't leave an indention into the patty, your burgers will kind of swell up and they'll make a, 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 a conclave kind of type thing. So with that um, indention in the middle, that helps it from having that curved appearance. You will know when it's time to 
turn your meat, um, whether it be steaks, your ribeyes, your porterhouse, anything like that, and your home and your hamburgers, whenever the liquid starts pooling on the top side of, you're only going to want to turn your meat, all right, twice. Put it on direct heat, indirect heat, let that side cook. You'll know when it's ready. If it's a steak or something like that, it should easily come off the grill when you flip it. Another indication that it's ready to flip is that blood, the moisture and everything will start pooling on the top part. And when that happens, that's another indication that it's ready to flip. So you flip it, your steak or whatever, and your burgers and the same thing and foolproof method to go from there. All right. Be food safe, guys. Um, I've included some information here on food safety questions, USDA meat and poultry hotline. Um, if you want that information, you're more than welcome to email me or you can call our office and talk to one of the uh, FCH agents, uh, Dr. Sanja Davis or Miss um, Amanda Cripple, or, um, and they will be glad to go over and share some information with you. Like I said, I'm not trained in foods and nutrition and so forth, but I am providing, I'm hopefully providing the resources that you need where you can get your answers from and so forth. Resources for today's presentation, we have several of them there. I use the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, food safety uh, document from TAMU is a really, really good one. Um, a lot of these are very repetitive. Um, a lot have a lot of these have the same rules, the guidelines and everything uh, as far as food safety, fire safety and so forth. Uh, uh, Beef Loving Texans is another really good one, has great recipes on it. Uh, just came back from a couple of cattle conventions, learning about cattle and um, heading to Nashville next week. I'm super excited about to the National Cattlemen's Association meeting. Thank you, a &R, Harris County a &R Committee for sponsoring my trip to do that. Uh, so we're always uh, promoting beef here. And uh, but there are a wide variety of things that you can grill. And uh, a couple of things that I didn't talk to you about, and I'm going to wrap this up while I go to the next slide. Guys, if you haven't thrown any fruit on the grill and had that grilled, whether it be fresh peaches or uh, pineapple rings or uh, bananas, anything with a high sugar content that's gonna caramelize, it'll slap you, make you wanna slap your mama. Okay, guys, so the grilled peaches, oh my gosh, with a little scoop of vanilla ice cream on the side, tastes just like peach cobbler. If you've never had it, Go to Pinterest, uh, Google grilled uh, fruits out there. Um, it's really, really good. All right. So that kind of wraps up our presentation today. And it just kind of leads me into our next um, session that we're going to be kicking off here um, in the uh, with the Harris County AgriLife Extension is our Lifescaping series. And we're going in person, guys. So um, there will be another option to see our smiling faces uh, in real person. So this is the schedule coming up. Uh, if you need the schedule, you can call our admin assistant, Ms. Susan Huber, or contact one of us. And uh, registration is on Eventbrite. But I wanted to personally invite y'all to my Grilling Like a Texan uh, program, which is gonna happen October 8th at Bear Creek Park from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, the cost is $25. There will be barbecue pits there. There will be food there. Uh, come with an empty stomach. You will leave with great resources and um, some great recipes. And we're going to have a lot of fun. So uh, if you want to grill like a Texan and you want to come and learn some new recipes and just have fun with a group of people who like to grill, come on out on October 8th. Uh, it's still going to be perfect grilling weather. Uh, we're going to be outside and you can register for that. Last thing is the homegrown lecture series that Ms. Brandy talked about uh, in the beginning, she alluded to, that is the remaining um, things there. I will tell you that um, we changed the date on the butter dishes, right, Paul? That is correct. Okay, which is now the 17th, I believe. Correct. So yep. that week yep. um, they will be back to back. So yep. growing microgreens will be on Thursday and 
Uh, and the the only reason why we are changing the date is we have to go for some trainings and meetings, so we will not be available to do it on uh, September 2nd. So um, we want to make sure you guys get the information. So uh, Shannon was able to move it to the uh, the day after um, the 17th. So um, uh, me and Brandy good. back to back. There you go. Yeah. All right. Uh, and Shannon. I do have a I couple questions. Information's there, so uh, that wraps it up. Brandy, Paul, yep. anything? Yeah, you have a couple questions. Um, okay. One was, what kind of cleaning products, tools do you use to clean the propane get grill? Okay, good question. So, um, guys, we really, I don't encourage you using the um, the brushes with the steel or the um, the fine metal brush kind of type things anymore. If you're going to use it to something to clean the grill with, because they can break off, they can become stuck to uh, the grates and you can actually pick those up with other foods and everything. And then you digest those and it's not a good thing. So what I suggest there is um, getting an aluminum foil and making a, a softball size uh, ball, ball out of it. I apologize y'all. Um, and then using that and scrubbing your grates, all right? It won't leave any um, residue there. And then once you get all the, the uh, grimes and the sticks, uh, the leftover pieces of meat that might be stuck on there, cut a large um, yellow onion in half. And then, and this applies to both uh, propane and charcoal. Um, and then rub that yellow onion on top of the grill grates and that will rem uh, clean the remainder of that off. So um, it's all natural and everything. So the aluminum foil ball and the half of a large yellow onion and you're good to go. All right, and uh, could you repeat the recipe for cleaning? Two teaspoons of what? Uh, it was one, uh, one teaspoon of bleach to one quart of water. Okay. Household bleach, yes. All right, and uh, I just wanted to put in my two cents that I, I like this presentation and I, I never let a, a, um, a charcoal grill just die out. I always have sweet potatoes on hand <laughs> and I'm obsessed with uh, when I'm done grilling. I, I put two or three out there and just with that leftover heat, uh, especially if it's a little bit cooler, it just, oh my gosh, it makes... Yep, yep. It makes Not the best sweet potato. really endless, guys. I mean, <laughs> be adventuresome. You know, if you haven't done it before, try it. I mean, you, you never know how it's going to turn out. There's so many options out there now that are uh, available to you. I see uh, if you're going to use skewers, guys, make sure you soak the skewers in water before you make kebabs or anything. Otherwise, they're going to burn like matchsticks. So that's just a little pro tip for you there. All right, we're good to go on this end. Thank you all very much, and um, I appreciate y'all's time. All right, thank you, Shannon. Bye, everyone. Be sure to fill out the survey that comes in the email. Thank y'all.